Thank you very much for coming this afternoon. Um, I'd like to introduce our, our speaker today. He's come to us all the way from Texas. Let's talk a little bit about John Locke. Uh, Dr. Stephen Ferdy is a professor of political science at the University of North Texas. He is author of The Ambition to Rule, Alcibiades and the Politics of Imperialism, which was published by Cornell, and most recently, Locke, Science and Politics, published by Cambridge in 2014. He's published articles and book chapters on American political thought, classical and modern thought, evolution and political theory, and international ethics, including, uh, by the way, uh, uh, one of the best things written on Benjamin Franklin uh, as a chapter in the History of American Political Thought volume, which of course is edited by Professor Sickenguy. I don't know if he's here, but don't tell him I said anything. Directing the faculty senate. Right? Yeah, that's what he must, yeah, he's always off doing something for faculty. But um, it's a great chapter on Benjamin Franklin, if you haven't read it. The title is um, Benjamin Franklin, a Model American and a, an American Model. Something like that. That's good. That was the title of something I read about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you've, read, you've read quite a bit on it. <laughs> Uh, he currently serves as uh, editor on the, uh, of the American Political Science Review, and today Professor Ferdy is going to talk to us about John Locke, liberalism, and modern science. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ferdy. Thank you. It's always a, a joy and an honor to speak here at Ashland Ashbrook. This is the book in question. So let's see what that chapter title was. <laughs> um, I've written some things on uh, Franklin, so I decided at, at the conclusion of the Locke book, just because I think Franklin is such a great example of the way Locke's teaching and his political philosophy actually plays out, especially in the American context, about 100 years later then. Uh, block. Okay, it looks like this was just called conclusion. Sorry. <laughs> I think it was the the, the title in the uh, Sakenga volume on American political thought that was entitled to the Model American Science. Okay, so what I'm going to try to do today, um, there are a couple of essays <laughs> that you all might have read of mine, and so I want to take some themes about John Locke. Uh, essays about John Locke. So I want to take a couple of some themes from those essays, hopefully, and talk about talk about them, and then we can have discussion about those themes or any other themes after the talk is over. So John Locke, obviously an important figure, a founder of the political system in which we live, uh, modern liberty, modern economics, a whole bunch of different things. So I undertook this this study of John Locke many years ago, and you know, I expected to find a certain John Locke there, and the John Locke that I found was actually quite different. So I want to, uh, to explore some unexpected elements of Locke's philosophy, or at least what I regarded as un unexpected, <clears throat> and then also to talk a little bit at least about the modern science angle, in case anyone is interested in that, I, I was very interested in. All right, so um, on Locke's liberalism. Locke is sometimes sort of regarded as a closet Hobbesian or a virtual Hobbesian or a Hobbes with a few extra tweaks. This is something that Locke has been charged with ever since Locke first wrote. You know, you're pretending not to be a Hobbesian, but you really are. I began by assuming that Locke was a kind of proto or quasi Hobbesian. But what I found was a Locke who was actually more, much uh, more civil, <laughs> more friendly than that, more charitable, more sociable, uh, and that certain certain works of his give us a false impression. So it's that part of the, uh, my theme that I will probably occupy most of our time today. The second theme is about modern science and liberalism, or Locke's liberalism. Locke was a great fan and follower of the modern scientific revolution started by Francis Bacon. Right? Baconian science, in Locke's view, refuted, did away with Aristotle. 
And so a lot of what Locke says in his essay concerning human understanding is really about Aristotle, Aristotle versus modern science. Locke was gung-ho in favor of modern science and I think wanted to put Aristotelianism and scholasticism especially to rest. So the good news is Aristotle is dead, modern science can proceed. The bad news is all morality, the traditional morality, depended upon the Aristotelian theory too. So what are we going to do now? What are we going to do with, to substitute for that part of Aristotle? Um, so I'll talk about that a little bit. And finally, the role of religion in Locke. Because this is something that people raise as an issue as well. Is Locke a Hobbesian? He pretends to believe in God, he pretends to rely on God, but he really doesn't. He's an atheist, he's a Hobbesian, et cetera, et cetera. Once again, I found in my researches, or I concluded, that Locke actually does rest upon some divine foundation for his natural law and for his, for his <coughs> theory. But we'll get to that in a minute. All right, so is Locke a Hobbesian? The basic thrust of, of Lockean liberalism. <coughs> um, well, what does Hobbes say? <laughs> Just a little bit of background. Google images are great. <laughs> um, okay. My ultimate, this is Hobbes, Hobbes, right? My ultimate goal is my own self-preservation. My only natural duty is to myself. The, fo the foundation of all morality is the individual's right to preservation, or even more narrowly, the individual's right to fight for their preservation. <clears throat> Any duties that the individual might have are, are completely derived from this duty to his self. Right? So if I have a duty to join the social contract, it's only because it's the only way for me to save my skin. If I have a duty to be nice to you whenever I can, it's only because that will help me survive, right? So uh, it's all completely individualistic, all completely selfish. The only fun foundational moral fact is the individual's duty to himself, or right to fight for himself and then duty to himself. So to put it more generally, right is unequivocally prior to duty. The right that I have is my basic moral fact. Duties are only derived from that right. So the priority of right to duty. Pre-liberal moral theories took the opposite tack, as you probably know. Sorry, you know. Plato and Aristotle and the whole Christian tradition, the Muslim tradition, the Jewish tradition. Duty was the prior fact there. Uh, which is to say, the, the orientation was the common good. The fundamental moral fact is society as a whole and the requirements for society. And so my moral, as an individual, my moral world is fashioned by how I fit into that social set and how I can best further the, uh, the interests of society. So I might have rights, but those rights are really derived from the common good. You know, individuals might have rights because that's the best way to serve the common good. So the point is, the duties were prior to the rights. So Hobbes basically reversed this, um, made the rights prior to the duties, made the duties completely <coughs> riveted. And as I said, Locke is accused of being a Hobbesian but I think that there are certain elements in Locke, which we'll look at here in just a second, uh, that indicate to, to the contrary. I think Locke has an actual firm pre-existing duty that individuals have that is actually prior to their right. Uh, if you look at his chapter on property, for example, which is a symbol of, his, of the most individualist side of Locke, of individual property rights. There are some limits on those property rights, like spoilage. In the state of nature, I can't take more than I need out of the common stock. Why? Because I'm robbing other people. If you had a, you know, in, in the Hobbesian scenario, there's no limit to how much I can take, because my right is prior. And Locke talks about spoilage. The chapters on 
family in the first and second treatises of uh, government by Locke are other places where Locke talks about duties that people have naturally to other human beings, parents to children. This is actually something that Hobbes had a little bit of difficulty accounting for. Anyway, fortunately, there probably never has been such a thing, such a thing as a Hobbesian family. <laughs> but uh, okay, so let's look at. Sorry for so much text in front of you, but this is this is chapter or paragraph six, chapter two of Locke's Second Treatise of Government. So. This is, this is the place where Locke describes what he means by the law of nature and how it is that people get to know it. Okay, so the law of nature, of course, is a big deal in John Locke. It's the law of nature that determines why, you know, why government must be limited. It's the law of nature that determines when a government has overstepped its bounds. You know, most of the, uh, the text of the U.S. Declaration of Independence is actually a list of grievances those are all supposed to be violations of Lockean natural law. It's necessary to establish that before you can rebel. Okay, so the natural law plays is a pivotal role in Locke's political philosophy, and I'm sure you've all seen this passage before. This is the only place that Locke ever pauses to tell us what the natural law is and why. That's actually kind of peculiar. Don't try to read all of this right now. <laughs> Uh, we will put zero in on a few things. Okay, so this is the Locke's description of the law of nature, which applies even in the state of nature, as Locke says. What does this fundamental moral logic tell us? Well, one thing that's striking, okay, you come down to paragraph seven there. So paragraph six here, this is all of it. Um, Locke never mentions rights here at all. This is all about duties, right? So this is somehow Locke's description of the, the bedrock of the moral universe for human beings. What is it? Okay, so how does this work? Um, I don't think this is... Uh, okay, I'm in the state of nature. What am I thinking? Reason, which is that law, teaches all mankind who will but consult it. Of course, that turns out to be a loophole. <laughs> As it turns out, most people are not consulting it in the state of nature. But being all equal and independent, no one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possession. And so but the same point is made again and again. This, these seem to be three different derivations of the same basic logic or principle. This is the one that relies on divinity and the others don't. So in the state of nature, I look out and I see you all, and I recognize that we are all Okay. What conclusion do I draw from that? I actually draw the conclusion, according to Locke, that my rights are limited by the fact of that law. Right? What's the first conclusion I draw? The first conclusion I draw is that I have a duty to respect your equal status with me. Now, in Hobbes's state of nature, individuals might look around, they'll see other human beings, recognize that everybody's similar, and draw the conclusion, wow, these people are dangerous, I gotta kill them all. <laughs> That's almost what it amounts to, right? So there's a big difference here. Locke says uh, that when you listen to your reason, your reason doesn't tell you to just look out for number one with Hobbes. Your reason tells you that you have a duty to respect others. So I, as I said, it's very striking that considering that Locke is so, so thoroughly associated with the modern liberal philosophy of rights, that he doesn't even talk about rights here. This is all about duties. This is the fundamental moral perspective. Paragraph 7, he 
finally brings the rights in here, although it turns out that really all he means there is that the rights are something that you all have a duty to respect in everyone else. All right, so there's this very peculiar character of this basic Lockean discussion of the natural law is that rights are really, I mean, the duties are there, he doesn't really bring in the rights. Or the right that I have is really the same as everyone else's right. <coughs> right? Or um, I suppose, maybe you could put it this way. When I listen to Lockean reason, that Lockean reason tells me that we're all equal and nobody here has any more right than anyone else, right? Whereas when I listen to Hobbesian reason, the Hobbesian reason is telling me, I'm in danger, I gotta do whatever it takes, you know, and nobody else's interests or rights have any, restrict, restrict me in any way. So, also here's an important principle he states. The law of nature, this is the paragraph seven, the law of nature with which willeth the peace and preservation of all mankind. So in a way, I suppose you could say, um, the law of nature for Locke is oriented to the human common good. Whereas the law, <clears throat> the right of nature in Hobbes is really directed toward the survival of each individual. So when, when I listen to my Lockean reason, my, that reason is telling me that I have a moral duty to take the perspective of the common good, which means I realize that I don't have a right to claim anything that no one else can claim. I do have a right to claim certain things, but I don't, I, I don't have a right to make any claims beyond what I allow to anyone else. That's the sense in which this egalitarian insight leads to a kind of moral conclusion for Locke. But, as I said, the logic is strikingly, well, I'm almost tempted to say Thomistic, in the sense that if the, the reason which is natural law is, is the, takes the point of view of the human common good, not simply of the individual. Okay. So, Let's look at Locke's discussion of property briefly. Okay, this, as I said earlier, is the place where Lockean individualism is, is, would come most to the forefront, right? Individual private property rights. So what does Locke say about that? Once again, if we go to the beginning of the discussion, we find something a little bit surprising, it seems to me. Uh, I mean, Locke says, okay, you're probably all familiar with these passages as well, all right, so everybody has the right to their preservation and consequently to eat and drink, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so what's the, this is based upon a divine command or a divine dispensation. Psalms, okay, God hath given the earth to the children of men, given it to mankind in common. But this being supposed, it seems to some a very great difficulty how anyone should ever come to have a property in anything. Okay, so this is strange again. The original situation vis-a-vis -vis property is not that we've each been given a right to just go out and take whatever we want. The earth is given to the race as a whole. It's common property to begin with. I mean, what, what God began with, or the original natural condition, is everyone, everything belonging to everyone. So how do we get this private property right? that Locke is so famous for. Well, of course, you know that you do this by laboring and it's, you add your labor and that's how things become your own private possessions. But, look at what Locke says here. Um, this is how he talks about, you know, appropriating through, through labor, essentially. Okay, God gave the world to men in common, but since he gave it them for their benefit and the greatest conveniences of life they were capable to draw from it, it cannot be supposed he meant it should have always remained common and cultivated. 
he must have expected people to appropriate from it. Okay, so the original situation actually is common ownership, not private property. But since the common ownership was, was instituted in order to serve the race as a whole, you know what, the only way that that's going to happen is if individuals can actually take things and eat them or cultivate them or do whatever you have to do to survive, wear them. Um, and so we get pri private property this way. But Locke's statement, again, I think is, is very striking. The private property, we, we must suppose that God intended private property to arise. What God instituted was common property. And then he said, okay, you go ahead and arrange things, and the result was private property. But the point is, the logic here is, individual private property is really just a means to a different end, and that end is the common prosperity of the human race. Again, the common good is the real, is, is the real goal of the natural law, or is the real goal of uh, the divine commands, the divine dispensation. Individual private property is just a means to the common good. A supposed means. Okay, so this is actually something that has led some interpreters of Locke to say that actually, in John Locke, private property rights are not nearly as solid as you think they are. Because if private property rights are really just a means to the common prosperity of the race, and not an indefeasible private right of each individual, you know, if, if we decided that private property no longer served the common good, we could abolish it, right? Because the real goal here is the common good of the race, not the private property. And that's the argument that some people draw out of this. And it actually Locke invites that logic here because he's, he's using the common good as the ultimate standard. Okay. Um, that is a potential problem, but I think that you know, if you look at Locke's argument, his argument is actually much more strong, strongly in favor of private property. That is to say, private property is just a means it's only a supposed means, and it wasn't the original situation set up by the law of nature. However, Locke makes the argument, private property is the only acceptable means to serve the common good. I mean, again, most of you probably read chapter 5 of the second treatise, the one about economic property and economics. That's the one where Locke kind of sketches the whole Econ 101 thing about how, you know, labor, you know, the more people labor, the more wealth is produced, and so if you allow them, if you allow people to labor and to keep the profits of their labor and to accumulate wealth without restriction, the result is going to be inequality, but the result is also going to be greater general prosperity, right? So the basic argument is, individual private property and the ability to accumulate without limit actually turns out to be the only good way to serve the common good. So, let me put it this way. Even though in reality, philosophically, private property is a means and not an end, I think Locke's argument is that it's the only end that we can take because it's the only truly effective way to serve the common good. But still, the common good is the real purpose of all of this <coughs> for Locke. Um, so, uh, it's important to recognize that fact that Locke's philosophy, even his economics, is really based upon this idea that the common, the human common good is the real basis of morality. Some kind of duties, rather than simply rights, you know the rights have a very great status in Locke. So if you look at the second treatise of government <coughs> overall, um, as I said, it's the one that, it's obviously the one that's best known in the world today. Maybe it's because it's relatively short. Well, and of course it's the one that, in, it's, it's the political one, it's the one that influenced the American Revolution and uh, really inaugurated modern liberal politics in general. In the second treatise of government, 
rights actually have a very, very high profile. I've been making the argument that, that in almost hidden ways, the common good and duties are the real basis of morality in the second treatise. Nonetheless, in the second treatise, rights are really the conspicuous thing. Rights to rebellion, rights to property. Uh, and so, in that respect, the second treatise of government is maybe Locke's most Hobbesian work. It's the one where he really doesn't talk about duties all that much. So you have to sort of dig deeply, read between the lines almost in some of these passages. In the first treatise, you may know, Locke argues that there is a moral duty to charity meaning to say, if you're rich and somebody else is starving, you have a duty to give that person. Okay, in chapter 5 of the second treatise, he says nothing about charity. Well, that's kind of strange, right? I mean, you think in, in a systematic philosophic discussion of property, if there was some kind of duty to share, you would include that in there? Especially said, since, as I said, let's see if I got okay. There, okay. In paragraph 42, Mr. Locke endorses charity in the first treatise, and the second treatise it's completely gone. I think the reason for that is that the second treatise is about serving the common good through great general prosperity by unleashing the power of the private profit motive and money, the power of money and all the rest of it. The problem with charity, I can put it that way, is that if you if you try to build charity and as a moral principle into your economy, will that undermine the engine of prosperity? Which what Locke is trying to do in chapter five and in the second treatise is to Create this engine of prosperity to serve the common good. The way you do that is by unleashing individual incentives and the profit motive and allowing people to keep it. If you lecture them too much about charity, that might put a damper on the engines of economic growth. You know? Still, I think it's very strange that in the first treatise there is this very strong statement in favor of charity that's completely absent from the second. That's why I say the second treatise is really a kind of Hobbesian document. There's no charity. The duties, I mean, Locke does talk about duties in the first treatise. You've seen that. But they're almost all negative duties. In there. You just have a duty not to harm another in his life, health, liberty, and possessions. Locke doesn't say there that you have any kind of positive duty to go out and help people. So the second treatise, even when it talks about duties, is that there are very minimal duties. It's mostly based on the uh, on the, the paradigm of looking out for number one, and that actually the way that the common good is served is by letting each individual look out for number one. Okay, that's the, that's the basic liberal organ law. Locke doesn't even go so far I mean, in, the second, in the second treatise talking about government, limited government, and the purposes of government. Locke doesn't even say anything like, you know, self-government is the most noble achievement of politics. In the language of nobility, I mean, why do we all adhere to democracy in the world today? Usually you hear that democracy is the best form of government because something about human dignity and nobility, right? The way it's presented mostly in the second treatise of uh, Locke is it's, it's just the best way to serve my self-interest. And maybe that is rationale behind it. So anyway, the point is the second treatise has a kind of Hobbesian cast to it. I mean, its moral perspective is relatively low. It has duties, but those duties are negative duties, they're minimal duties. Otherwise, it's mostly self-interest and individual right and the engines of prosperity. And that befits liberalism, but I think it's, we have to worry about uh, you have to worry about whether it's true to Locke, partly because 
you know, liberalism is sometimes <coughs> chastised for being such a minimal and selfish political philosophy. I would argue, or I have argued, or I argue in here in the essays that you read, that Locke's, the second treatise is really just a part of Locke's teaching, and it's like the lower half of Locke's moral teaching. And that's because the theme there is government. And you know, definitely is Locke's argument, and this is the liberal argument, that government's task is a very limited task. Government's task really is only serving self-interest. So since the second treatise is the only about the only thing that people read of Locke anymore, they therefore conclude that that's, that's Locke's whole view of what the, the moral landscape. The second treatise is just describing the moral landscape that government is concerned with. And the whole point is that's a very limited moral landscape. If you look at some of the other things that Locke wrote, they're very striking in a different direction. If I can get this to go in the right one. The letter concerning toleration. Maybe his second most famous work. Uh, he's talking about tolerating people you know, of, you know, of other differing religious beliefs, and he says, we may not, must not content ourselves with the narrow measures of bare justice. Charity, bounty, and liberality must be added. This the gospel enjoins. This reason directs, and that natural fellowship we are born into requires of us. See, that's something you would never suspect if you just read the second treatise of government. These are, he's saying here, you have positive duties, not just negative duties to other people. And not just fellow Christians or fellow Baptists or whatever it might be. And reason tells you that this natural fellowship of all mankind, this is a very friendly law, right? Somehow there's a, a common fellowship of mankind that gives us all these moral duties that go beyond just not harming one another. Now, obviously, the government can't enforce, according to law, the government can't enforce these more extensive duties. Which is why, in the second treatise, all you see is this. This is the part that the government enforces. Government this doesn't have anything to do with politics, but it still is a human moral duty, according to Locke. Locke wrote, wrote this educational treatise, Some Thoughts Concerning Education, where he outlines uh, an educational curriculum, largely a moral educational curriculum for a child. And it's very interesting because you know, it shows how, how Locke thinks a well-raised child would wind up. Like, how should you lock by them? We didn't have any children, so we could give other people advice on how to raise their children. <laughs> but this is remarkable because, once again, we get a, a, a glimpse into a moral teaching that's much richer than what you can see in the second treatise of government, right? which is the true moral perspective that Locke takes. I mean, how should human beings behave? How should they treat one another? Um, once again, he says, Locke reiterates this, the preservation of all mankind is the true basis of morality. That's the sort of common good perspective. And he's trying to make the, the child take that perspective to heart. If the if everyone really believed in this, uh, then our religion, politics, and morality uh, would be much quieter and better natured than it is. One of the things that Locke does in this educational treatise is um, try to <coughs> teach the child a proper attitude towards property, a big theme from chapter five of the second treatise, right? And what's striking there is Locke doesn't tell this child about their rights, the first thing he tries to do is, the first thing you have to get a child to do vis-a-vis -vis property is to get them to share it. <laughs> if you ever have kids, you'll probably <laughs> Kids have no problem glomming onto property as they are to their own. It's much more important 
first to teach them how to share. In other words, to limit their claims on property, to be willing to not be so obsessed about their own personal uh, well-being or their personal their personal possessions. So Locke says, actually, charity, bounty, and liberality is what you really need to try to drum into a child. <coughs> not their personal property rights. So in this, in this educational treatise, in fact, it's actually striking once again that Locke says almost nothing about rights at all. Uh, the perspective is more one of duties. The crowning achievement of this education is something that Locke calls civility, which is, you know, these, this child or these children need to learn how to interact with others, to share, and to be delighted in sharing, in being nice to one another, in being civil, in being kind. So there's a kind of sweetness of mind. This is the way Locke wants us to turn out. Not just money-grubbing, <laughs> rights-hoarding, Hobbesians, right? So in a way, I think that Locke's perspective might be put this way. Hobbes gave us just individual rights as the bedrock and tried to build some kind of social duties and obligations out of that, but it's all really rooted in my own self-preservation. I think Locke might say, that can't work because it will just degenerate into selfishness. The only way that you can really get people to the only way you can really support justice, which is to say, treating everybody properly, is by starting with concern for the others, not by starting for concern with myself. Right? So you have to somehow teach the duty first and the right second, or else everybody's rights will be insecure. Right? In other words, people will not securely respect everybody else's rights unless they're first taught that it's their duty to do that and only later tell them about what their rights might be. So that's the way that Locke rhetorically proceeds. <coughs> so, uh, conclusion for that general uh, treatment of Hobbes versus Locke is that uh, there's a reason why Locke is known as a partial Hobbesian. It's because the Second Treatise of Government really has something of that cast, and that's the most widely read thing today and for a long time now. <clears throat> but we have to bear in mind that uh, Locke's actual moral theory is of much wider scope that it actually teaches about our duties and <clears throat> it is concerned for the common good and even regards that human common good as the basic moral fact. Now, the one reason why this is important is because, uh, as you may know, liberalism is often charged with being a, an impoverished political philosophy because it's based upon, supposedly based upon, individual rights first and duties only second. It is said that any society in which rights are, are put at the forefront or at the centerpiece will inevitably degenerate into a kind of selfishness. For social purposes, you need to have people also respecting others' rights, obeying the law, right? Just doing the right thing. The accusation is that liberalism, because it, it rests upon rights rather than duties, inevitably in the long run undergoes a kind of moral degeneration in which you just wind up with me, 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 and to hell with the common good. I mean, you're probably aware of this kind of, <laughs> this moral decay issue though in society. Well, liberalism is sometimes, liberalism itself is sometimes taken to be the, the root of that because of its emphasis on individual duties, on individual rights rather than duties. But I think that Locke can be partly at least <coughs> exonerated from that because 
his philosophy really is not as rights-centric as we think. And I think when some of the American founders adopted his ideas for the Declaration of Independence and the basic American social setup, they were looking at that more responsible lock, you know, the lock for whom you know, devotion to country or to others is at least as important as individual rights. Um, and would probably prefer to see a culture more oriented towards the kind of communal concerns rather than simply the culture of number one, which the rights philosophy tend is in danger of producing. Okay, let me spend a little bit of time talking about the two other themes that I have. Block and science and then the religious, you know, all the talk about God that we've been seeing. So lock and science. And there's a little bit of metaphysics here, so I'll try to keep this palatable. Because it's a we're it's it's lock or bacon versus Aristotle, I guess is what I got. So that's why we have to get metaphysical here. All right, so as I said at the beginning, Locke is a huge fan of this modern Baconian science. But since the Baconian science required the overthrow of the old Aristotelian scheme, it created two different philosophical or, and or cultural crises. One is epistemological. I mean, how can we know anything? Or what, is it, what kind of knowledge is science capable of? And the second is the moral one, the moral theory that, that uh, that went out the window along with the Aristotelian epistemology. All right, so briefly, the old, more, the old science, the Aristotelian science, was, uh, let's just compare it to the Platonic. You probably know about the Platonic ideas and maybe even the, the Aristotelian formal causes. The idea was that um, you know, a tree is a tree, what, what accounts for a tree being a tree is the form of tree, right? That sort of metaphysical entity. What Aristotle was trying to figure out is how do we explain the regularities in the world around us? I mean, experience is not chaotic. The world is divided into kinds of things, and we recognize those kinds of things. So the explanation for that are the Plato's forms and the Aristotelian formal causes were intended to explain that. There, there, there are these metaphysical intelligible entities, forms, that somehow account for the different thing, things being divided up into these kinds. And so, therefore, true science means not knowledge of every individual tree. You have to have to come to some knowledge of the form of the tree, the abstract form, right? And once you once you've grasped the form of tree, then you have certain 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 promised. Okay, Bacon decided that these formal causes don't exist. The world is not ruled by platonic ideas or anything like it. The world is just matter in motion, organized into regularities only because of the natures, the nature of matter and the laws of motion. There is no governing intelligible template. But that means we also can't have any certain knowledge. You know, empirical knowledge cannot attain certainty. I mean, we can observe 10,000 trees and come up with certain generalizations, but we never know whether the 10,000 of first tree will somehow refute what we've just learned, right? So all of modern science, as you may know, is probabilistic because empirical knowledge can only be probabilistic. This is and something that Bacon and all the modern scientists were willing to put up with. Okay, that doesn't kill modern science as long as you're willing to say modern science doesn't achieve certainty, but just a very, very high degree of probability. The problem is, as I said, the moral theory, which Bacon didn't seem to be too terribly concerned about. But Locke, as you know, he's the he's the the science guy who's going to come in and try to figure out how we construct a moral theory to substitute for the, blast, the blown up Aristotelian theory. Well, the problem is 
Locke agrees with the modern scientist that nature has no moral content. I mean, matter in motion cannot be the source of any moral impulses. I mean, there's an is and there's an ought, and there's no way of dividing it. I mean, we're a fact value kind of distinction. So, whereas Aristotle said those forms imbue nature with some moral content, right? So, the reason why human beings have a kind of moral obligation to perfect themselves in a certain way, to behave in a certain way, is because it's your duty to try to live up to that human form. But, if you're just a bunch of atoms assembled in a certain way, that could have been assembled differently, and in reality, you're just a little more complicated than the birds that are flying out there, but it's basically the same kind of thing. How could any such being have a moral avocation or a moral, any moral command on? Okay, so here's where um, uh, Locke struggled with this, and I think he came to the conclusion that theology was indispensable. If there is no morality in nature, meaning matter in motion, physical, material nature, if there are going to be any moral laws, he's talking about these political laws, they're going to have to come from outside of nature. And so you need this supernatural source for the moral laws. So for that reason, I think Locke is indeed serious about this more about the, the theological underpinnings. It's not just window dressing, but it's, it's philosophically required by his his way of substituting for the old Aristotelian theory. I mean, it's true, right? We all recognize this somehow. But the modern scientific view of the world has difficulty supporting any kind of moral theory. Just bare matter. That's why Locke had said we have to have recourse to a divine lawgiver uh, to impose those from outside. As, as okay, so I think my argument is that theology is essential to Locke for that deep philosophic reason, because of the way he's engaging the, the new anti, the uh, post-Aristotelian reality. But of course, he also believed that uh, theology was necessary for practical reasons. <coughs> there is a famous remark in a letter concerning toleration that one one group of people that that shouldn't be tolerated is atheists. Because if they don't they don't believe in any divine rewards and punishments, you can't count on them the other moralities. It's not sufficiently supported. Um, so for practical reason, I think Locke also believed that society requires kind of divine support or requires belief in God. And of course, especially if we add what I was saying at the, the early part of my talk, that Locke, Locke gives us more robust duties than we ordinarily think. Perhaps it's even more essential to bring God into the picture. So let me stop there. And if there are any questions at all. <coughs> There's a <lot> again. <laughs> yes. First, thank you for coming. Uh, 